right, guys. Uh, stand by. I'm gonna just make sure that everything is tight. There we go. Put the audio. Let me know if you guys can see my picture okay, and if my audio is good. This is Tony Leonard uh, for ZBrush Live here on Saturday, four o'clock. Yeah, what do we got here? What's today's date? It's the twenty-fourth. Give me a shout out in the chat and let me know if uh, sound and picture are okay. If I need to make any uh, adjustments, I will do so. Alright, I'm going to switch to screen. As soon as I get this wrapped up, I'll... There we go. Here we go. Alright. There we go. Just let me know if uh, everything is looking good, sounding good. Hi, OxArtV. How's it going? Hello. Yeah, no picture? Uh, probably today, um, my video camera has taken a bit of a dive, and unfortunately, uh, I can't, uh, show <laughs> myself. Uh, usually I have a feed of my camera, my video web camera, on me, myself, but, uh, my PC has been a little bit finicky, and for some reason, my webcam, no samurai sword, unfortunately. I, I keep that, I keep that uh, hidden, hidden and locked away. <laughs> Hi, Zeno Shadow. How's it going? Picture is good. Cool. Here, I'm just gonna do a little pan around, just make sure everything's cool. So movement is okay, and sound is okay. Yeah. Okay. So today. I kind of wanted to take a few back steps and review some things that I was working on uh, last time around. And, and that way you guys could kind of get a sense of the directions that I'm moving in uh, in some of these streams. And I think I was kind of uh, at a point where I was doing a concept mesh. Uh, and we talked about, if you, if you missed the last stream, we kind of talked about how I used uh, Marvelous Designer just a little bit to add in some cloth elements. Uh, mostly for the cape and the vest and um, I myself I'm still a little bit new to marvelous but it's actually not that bad to easy you know to easily start out and uh, start you know uh, creating garments and or uh, cloth simulations of your own um, and add them to, to models to make them a little bit more interesting especially character models so I'm doing a, a couple of cyborgs that uh, I'm hoping will shape up to be something pretty cool and I'm kind of breaking it down uh, just to show you a little bit of process. So last time around, um, I think uh, I was working on the head section of this. And in just a second, I'm going to hide some of these pieces. And I'm going to finish out uh, detailing some of the parts or elements of the head. So now we have like the head cap, uh, all of these being separate pieces of geometry uh, that I either used the A, uh, Z-Sphere append method, uh, for retopology, uh, and then I, you know, uh, upresed that piece of geo and added a few interesting um, uh, alpha stamps to give out detail. Um, maybe using also, uh, if you guys are familiar, there's a gentleman. His name is Malicus the Black, or at least that's his moniker on uh, ZBrush Central. Uh, he has some great uh, uh, brushes that I, I've used for years now. Um, mainly one or two of them that have like some nice uh, cut line bevels 
uh, to use and that's where I get a lot of these straight lines uh, and then you know I'll kind of talk over some of those and maybe you know you can get yourself uh, or, or make uh, some alpha stamps that you can use and every once in a while I'll actually build in certain p bits of detail by using the actual geometry itself uh, his name is Molochus, uh the black he has a series of brushes called Mawcut. Uh, I will spell it out in the chat. I believe it's M-A-H uh, cut. Uh, and he's done some, I think it's called A and then also B. Uh, if you did a search for it in the ZBrush Central, I'm sure you would, you would find him. Uh, but yeah, th those are some of his brushes that I've used in the past and up to the present. Uh, and if you wanted something a little bit more steady than like say uh, uh, Damien Standard, which Damien Standard has an alpha that's really nice, but I think uh, Damien might in some ways be a little loose and or a little uh, deep of a score. And Malikas, uh, he has his Mawcut A and I believe B brushes. Uh, I think it's called Mawcut A and B uh, to be specific. Uh, those have a very nice uniformed uh, sort of look when you start cutting into the mesh. So I use those for some of the cut lines. Uh, and then eventually, after I do some topology uh, and get it a little bit more detailed, uh, let me flip over, sorry, I just had to restart my machine. So I'm gonna start up uh, Photoshop. Uh, there's something I wanna show you guys. Divorced Uncle Adam Bale, what an interesting name. Thank you. Glad you <laughs> glad you dig it. So I'm gonna come here. Let me see if I can open it from my recent. There it is. So the end result that I picked out for you guys is to do something like this. Since a lot of the times uh, when I build models uh, on the stream here uh, in ZBrush Live, I'm kind of focused on um, getting you guys kind of going on ways that you could do ZBrush models that you can interpret as a, a 2D static design, uh, but you could probably, with a little bit more work, get them into, like, say, a render engine. But this is just a small piece that I devised uh, in between the, I, th I think it was, what was it, two weeks ago when I streamed, um, to have a, a piece that I can show you guys. And I, I've been posting uh, on ZBrush Central, so if you guys, in fact, let me see if I can open the link, because uh, just really quickly, in uh, ZBrush Central, I have made a post so you can go back and see some of the projects that I've been working on in here. Um, let me see. Give me one second and I'll just pull up the uh, link for you guys. Unfortunately, I didn't bookmark it. I just posted it and I should have bookmarked it, but my bad on that one. But it wasn't that long ago, so I have, shouldn't have to dig too, too deep in the... Uh, and ZBC to probably find it, but uh, one second, and I will get you guys a link. Doop to doop. Uh, find latest post. There we go. Here we are. All right. So this should work, but I'll copy and paste the link and put it in the chat. Uh. The 2D half of it, most of it was placed, um, I'm gonna actually go through the layers and I'll show you the breakdown. But the render itself was done in Keyshot. Uh, you guys could have a look here. There's a ZBrush uh, central link for pretty much all of the static images that I've, I've created so far or projects that I've been working on in ZBrush uh, Live. Uh, I posted to one thread just to show and you guys can take a look and probably try to you know, post haste to uh, give you guys a, a good way to ask me questions and, and I'll try to get back to them uh, via the thread. Hey Doug, how's it going? So, uh, what we have here um, is basically a couple of different things. There's some place textures and layer effects, uh, a few different uh, blending layers that are gone on this, and a few layers that actually have little small painted on details. Uh, and I think they're probably a little bit noticeable the closer you get in. But I just took a medium res uh, output, uh, like render, of the model. 
uh, and then started tweaking it and doing a couple of, you know, just like hand-drawn details to, you know, sort of solidify the design. Uh, and then I think uh, I had some nice HUD element brushes in Photoshop that I used, and then with some uh, different... Ah, uh... uh, you can't click on the smartphone. Uh, no worries. If you, if you can't, uh, I'll try to find a way. But if you search for me on ZBrush Central, um, you can probably search my, my username, which is uh, Koro. That's K-O-R-O. Uh, kind of like my moniker, but just half of it uh, for ZBrush Central. Uh, search this name, and then just look at my recent post. Um, you should be able to find the most recent post where I, I posted all of these things. And it has, uh, for example, I'm not sure something's broken in here, but uh, I started off from some of the Blade Runner inspired pieces that I did. Uh, so you can, guys can go back and make comments or ask questions uh, on any individual piece uh, so far. And I'll be glad to try to post up some screenshots and uh, show you guys some of the stuff that I've been working on. But I, I think also uh, Kyle and the good guys over at uh, Pixelogic, they're probably thinking to do alternatively some kind of uh, gallery. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll see how, you know, what they come up with. But I don't want to ruin it. Uh, but yes, back to this. Okay, so if I go back and I kind of uh, give you guys sort of a basic run of it. I'm going to turn this off. Basically when you come out of Keyshot, uh, and I'm using the Keyshot bridge, uh, I shot the model over to Keyshot, posed it, and saved a camera. Uh, and in that camera, you know, uh, I think that I only set up just like a small bit of uh, a DOF or that's uh, depth of field settings, uh, just to, to give a little bit of uh, a look from the depth map, but uh, that's that's sort of an optional thing. Uh, but just a, a straightaway shot with one camera, and what you'll get in your 32-bit uh, uh, render file is basically a layer that says RGBA, if you can see here. I know it's a little bit small on screen. Ah, great. No worries. Uh, and this is your base render, right? So I just used like a basic uh, type of material. I think uh, I, I tend to use a, a lot of um, materials from Zebro. Uh, I think he's a South Korean uh, ZBrush artist that has a really good, uh, really good uh, series of matte caps. And I shot it over to Keyshot, and you know, there's not too much as far as lights. There's maybe just like one HDRI. I have like a, a sort of default uh, set of HDRIs that I, I've been using uh, that stem from uh, my using a Gear 360 camera for Samsung phones. Uh, and I went through downtown LA and took a bunch of like test HDRIs and converted them myself in Photoshop so that I can use them in Keyshot. So. You know, besides using like standard issue HDRIs, you can actually make your own. And uh, at some point, uh, I think I'll probably try to cover how to make your own HDRIs for use because you can use those in, in uh, ZBrush uh, and also Keyshot. So once I brought it in, this is the actual render layer. And then the render passes, as you can see here, uh, is kind of where I did a lot of the, the grunt work uh, of this whole thing. And I'll just go down and I'll start checking things out, uh, or off rather, so that you can kind of see what's under the hood here. So I'll go down. And kind of um, one of the things when I work with stuff like this, I, I don't really organize my layers too well. Uh, I just keep adding. Uh, but I, I try to organize them at least within a, a folder. So I'll uncheck and go down. Uh, and there's a few other setups that I think I've previously discussed that I'll give you guys uh, a little bit of information on it. So checking down to about my lighting setup, uh, I'll just show you guys this really quick. Uh, I believe if I pull this out a little bit more. Okay, so what I have here uh, is probably the first thing uh, that I start working with. And it's just basically, again, um, oh yeah, the HDRIs are, are really cool. Um, to make. But for this, what I started doing was just using a, a channel mixer uh, and hue and saturation 
uh, in conjunction with the geometric normal. So in uh, Keyshot, here I'll just take this for example, and I'll from ZBrush go into render, uh, an external render, and Keyshot, right? And my material for this is just the standard issue. Uh, I think it's uh, one of the included uh, mat caps, the green metallic, which is a really nice one. Uh, because um, whenever I try to sculpt things, I, I try to use a material that will allow me to pick up and see a lot of the lighting and details uh, as I carve into the mesh. And so for that, there's, there's enough detail that, that is visible, right? If I use something that's light gray or uh, maybe too dark, I'm not going to be able to see the lighting and forms as I, I keep sculpting. So there's that. And then I'm just going to go over here and hit BPR, right? So just to show, external render, key shot. Uh, auto merging is fine, um, but if not, you know, you don't need it. Uh, I don't think. But for this, it, every every sub tool that I have should be labeled uh, individually. So I try to go through and I, I relabel everything that's going to be shown, right? So I hit BBR and it's going to set it up and shoot it over to Keyshot. And whoop. Sorry, it's on my second monitor. I'm going to pull it over to the main screen so you guys can see once the model is moved over. Because basically every time it sends something to Keyshot, it actually saves out what I believe are cached files. Uh, and it sends it to Keyshot to, to set it up in a scene. So depending on how many parts you might have, it might take a second to, to send over. 50%, 60, 100, Oh, come on. Come on, come on. There we go. Oop. Here we go. Got to pull this over here. Okay. So I believe uh, this was probably my scene, or at least one of them. Uh, actually, I'll just cancel that. Okay. So we got it in here. And for HDRI. I think I used one of my own customs so I can just search for it very quickly. Uh, I just use my initials and find it. And so here's my downtown LA HDRI, which I can drag and drop, and it puts it into the scene, right? So mostly because I just want the lighting information, I'm just gonna go ahead and hit spacebar and bring up my scene. Uh, there are the, basically what is the project tab. So it's scene material, ah, gracias. Uh, Scene, material, environment, lighting, camera, image, and I'm gonna first go over to environment and hit on color, right? So that way I can choose a background color or a mat uh, from which to work on. In the case of the render that I did, uh, I think I started with uh, doing one in black. And so I'll just use a RGB color picker to choose black, hit okay. Uh, and then maybe, you know, I'll set up a, a camera view, so something maybe kind of like this. I'm not sure if I still have the same camera saved. Oh, because this is a new import, I guess I didn't save the, the camera. There is no saved camera data. But I could probably save individually the camera data and open it. Ooh. Sorry about that. Phone's going off. Thank you. Um, thanks, James. Blends. Thank you. Um, so... Anyway, so this is how it comes in and you know on this side you're probably picking up some yellow light uh, if you keep you know going on your environment tab and clicking on the color to turn it off you can go back to natural the, the lighting environment uh, and kind of see where you pinpoint light sources from. If you wanted to add to that in a lot of cases this is what I do. Uh, I go over to the HDRI editor, depending on which version of Keyshot, like if, for example, I'm using the Keyshot 7 Pro, uh, and I can click here and add a pin. And that pin will basically be a source of light uh, from the lighting environment, uh, which kind of depends on you know the direction of which things are coming from. 
Um, if there are some highlights or anything that I really want to pick up on the object, I can control left mouse button to add a highlight. Uh, so I'll go ahead and hit control left mouse button and click on the model and it'll give me highlights from that that one point. So I can also kind of come in here and click on the pin uh, and add color. So let's say for example I want to grab a little bit more of the yellowish sort of orange cast light that's coming from some of these storefronts. Uh, I can go ahead and click on that. Uh, and you can also make finer adjustments like uh, the radius, the fall off, uh, and adjust it to your liking, right? So maybe I want to increase my fall off uh, and do it from edge, uh, or I can change the blend mode, blend it, uh, which maybe might be a little bit less severe. Oh, excuse me. Just one second. There we go. So, sorry about that. I had somebody coming to the door. <laughs> Phone's going off. But anyway, I can click done when that's all ready, uh, and say let's let's go with this lighting environment. I think that's that's probably well enough. So I can choose there, and I can replace the. Uh, I go back to settings here, choose color, um, and then that would be just great, right about there, right? Uh, and then of course you know you can set up your render. So each pass that I may make, like the default material, like this gray material that I came from ZBrush with, I can keep this, but I can also use other materials uh, in the case where, uh, let's say for example, the sheen that you had in ZBrush, like at this level, uh, there are a few layers that I use different materials, uh, but I kept the camera the same. So what you wanna do is you wanna be able to go into Keyshot, uh, and set up your camera and also you might want to check your lighting uh, Generally under lighting I go with something that's like a custom uh, No global or ground illumination uh, Self shadows. Yes, uh, but I might adjust the shadow quality and do say five uh, With a fewer amount of ray bounces just for time, right? So that way I can get you know rich shadows in a short amount of time. So I'll just hit three with that uh, And I'll go ahead I'll hit enter and under camera I'll set up a new camera so this this camera with a plus mark here and I'll just say POV which is point of view for camera talk POV 1 and that'll be my my first perspective that, that I, I want to keep and that I can you know alter or you know do some fine settings to like uh, depth of field you can check that uh, and as you increase the focal distance so it, the focal distance being the point at which you have depth that is starting to blur. Uh, you can increase it along with your f-stop. So like, let's say you increase your f-stop. If I go kind of in the, the extreme, probably on either end of the spectrum, it's gonna start to blur. Uh, and that will give me my z-depth pass. Uh, so, you know, you probably have to do a sort of look and feel and adjust this to see what kind of focus that you're getting out of it. But having that uh, channel for the depth pass uh, allows me to do some uh, focusing things later on. So you want to be able to under render, hit render, control P, and you'll get a panel like this uh, where I can set up my you know, details for rendering later on. Like uh, if I'm gonna include all of the different passes uh, like say uh, the normal depth and clown pass, ambient occlusion and shadow, uh, just for, for basics. Uh, maybe in some cases you'll probably want diffuse or the lighting information passes uh, to toy with in Photoshop. Um, you're gonna want to add these to Photoshop or add to PSD. Uh, and most importantly, because unless you choose this option, all of these maps will probably come out as 32-bit EXR files that are individual. Uh, sometimes Photoshop is a little bit tricky with importing EXRs, I know. So, you know, I, I still, in fact, have to do some homework on that one. But uh, you should be able to just add to PSD. Uh, if the PSD is 32-bit, you can always down-res it uh, or down-res the, the bit uh, size from like say 32 to 16 to 8 uh, but what I'll do is I'll go into presets and do just like a standard 1920 by 1080 which is high res enough 
at 300 dpi and this would be your literal print size right uh, naming the file so I'll go ahead and give it a, a name TL ZB test shot there we go uh, and as for the folder usually it will default to a rendering or the renderings folder which is uh, one of the default folders inside of your documents uh, that is, stores all of the, the renders that you output from, from Keyshot but you can actually change that so like if you wanted a different uh, uh, directory you know like a project folder you can just click it and you know find out you know your folder or make a folder from there so I'm just doing a little a little test here to show you how to set this up yeah uh, under options, uh, what I'll probably try to do is just do like a, a minimum amount of time in some cases. If I'm doing some look development, I don't need to give it maximum samples because if you do maximum samples, it will try to take uh, as much sampling time to to uh, actually render it, uh, doing like several traces over the, the model. Uh, but in this time, you know, we, we don't really have a lot of time, or I don't want to take up too much of your time to do this because it's kind of like watching paint dry. So I'll do something short, like within five minutes, say, you should be able to get a fairly decent uh, render for 2D, right? So I think uh, in the case of the Photoshop file that I showed you, I think I used maybe like two or three minutes. So I'll just hit two and do that. Uh, using uh, real-time CPU settings, I think for me, I'm using, uh, I have an eight-core machine. Uh, and another eight core machine, which actually for Intel, because of hyper threading, will actually show more cores. So, not to be confused by that. So, I'll just uh, you know go ahead and do something like choose seven cores so that I'm not using all of my CPU uh, and then just leave it, leave the rest. And then now I can you know choose all of the uh, passes that I'm going to use. So, mostly at its core, I'm going to use clown depth. Uh, or the geometric uh, normal pass, uh, also shadow and ambient occlusion, and adding those to the Photoshop file, right? So, back to Photoshop. That's pretty much how I get all of the base layers for what is in these render passes, right? And I actually use the clown pass first and foremost uh, to create a mask. And if, it's kind of hard to see here, but I'll move this layer up top so it's out of the mask range. Basically, this is a clown pass, which is uh, basically a masked off uh, color keyed uh, selection pass uh, that you can use to create a, a, a just a simple one click mask or selection of any of the various subtool parts. So. Um, Either if you have one material that you're using for the cape, uh, you can just use the magic wand tool and select it, right? Uh, and if you have this selection, you can actually change it to a non-destructive mask by adding a layer mask, right? So the same thing is for the whole object. So I'll just select the black here and here. Uh, and you can actually add masks to groups of layers. So if you have a group, that has your render passes uh, you can simply on that just click uh, add layer mask and it'll mask off everything that's inside of that group without having to do it to each layer right so that's pretty handy right. so uh, there's that I'll put that back and I'll hide it so going down the most interesting thing and in, you guys saw me do this in some of the do the colors assigned by subtools or for subtools and polygroups? Actually, I believe it does it by subtools or materials. Like if you had a different material in each section, it would actually clown pass each part out. Uh, sometimes working with render layers in Keyshot, and that if that's something probably at another point I'll get to talking about in Keyshot. Um, you can actually break up each, uh, break up like a, an in instance file for each material. Uh, and then you can use scripts inside of Photoshop to uh, batch those together and it'll automatically read each file and put the file together and, and place them where they need to be uh, just by running a script. In fact, um, had I done render layers, I'd probably go under file, 
uh, and I believe it's either under scripts uh, and load files into stack is what it is. Yep. So that way you can take, say, um, all of the render layers that it provided from, say, 001 to 00 or 010 or, t you know, like if you had 10 different materials, load that file stack in and it would one by one place them into layers uh, that you can manipulate uh, individually. So like if you really want to have the fine control of each each material, you can do that, right? Ah, uh, yeah, saving for Keyshot Seven Pro. Yes, it it it's it's probably worth having. I would I would say it's a it's a great app. Uh, mostly, the difference being if you watch the different version uh, versions that are that are out. Uh, probably having control with the HDRI editor is really pretty awesome. Um, so anyway, let's go back to this because there's some fun stuff here. I, mean, I was going to mention if you had watched the stream previous where I was doing some environment stuff inspired by Blade Runner, uh, I talked about the geometric normal and this is kind of like one of those awesome things where uh, you have hue and saturation and then you have a channel mixer uh, and then you have what is a clipping mask parented down to the geometric normal, right? So. Normally, here I'll turn these off just briefly. A geometric normal would look like this, right? And it looks a little bit more orange than you think of a, a world space or a tangent space normal. Uh, probably closer to what is like a, almost like a world space normal. Uh, but that's only because the hues and the lighting directions have changed that it's changed from its usual blue RGB sort of value, right? But if you have something like this, what you can do is you can do this, use this to change the direction of light or uh, bump up a specific uh, rim or highlight colors inside of uh, your Photoshop render from Keyshot, right? Uh, and then this is traditionally set, uh, probably lastly set, as a color dodge layer, right? So as a color dodge with hue and saturation and also channel mixer turned on, I'm getting brighter uh, brighter light instances or rim light or cast light on the model from like say the back uh, where it may have been more middle or forward and what I've done is I've created a couple of layers in between just using pure red like uh, I guess the RGB red uh, and just use the gradation tool to add in extra lighting Right, so in the original Keyshot render, I didn't have uh, multiple uh, bits of geometry. Uh, I just wanted to simply uh, add, you know, uh, extra highlights to the model by adding in, you know, various uh, little popped uh, gradations. So I'll come in with, you know, just the gradation tool uh, on layers like this. I hit key G on my keyboard, uh, which for some reason is not working. I don't know why. There we go. So the G, and I'll use the color picker, go down to absolute red, and just use something like this. Now the gamut looks like it's out of range, but it, I'm not actually printing the in, in, in gamut color or anything like that. It's just for screen value, and uh, it's not really going to matter because it's going to convert it to light. So uh, finally, if you were doing something for print, I think the only thing that you would really want to be careful of is uh, is making sure that your print values are not exceeding 300 in their value for CMYK, right? So like if uh, C, M, and Y plus K equal more than 300, you might get some overbleed kind of uh, problems. But for screen art and or, you know, uh, just, you know, even for print, you know, it shouldn't be too too bad. Even you, I don't think there's a reason to really worry about the, the gamut up here. I'm just using it as a light source. So anyway, you use the. It won't yeah it won't get you a hundred percent there. So that's why like I do a lot of post stuff in Photoshop to sort of tweak things and and you know but it's all of everything is you know all of the details are for the most part sculpted, which is the awesome part. And you can do sort of like a proxy model without a whole lot of detail and add a lot of hand drawn details inside of Photoshop. So that's why like things like the arm or the, the servo here at the elbow or the piping or the tubing for his uh, forearm, 
uh, you know, it looks pretty simple. And in fact, I think this is just like a curved tube that I placed in, you know, just for, for proxy. I think I'll probably build something out um, later on, uh, just like I have here with the retopology of some of the head pieces, right? But as I add these gradations in, they create light sources, so they end up much more like this. Uh, and for each one, I can change their intensity or, you know, mess with the overall opacity and, you know, it'll create more of a light source or less of a light source, right? So going along, uh, if I wanted to change the overall lighting again, uh, I can click here, double click here, and just a, uh, you want to make sure to check the monochrome uh, and you can adjust your R, G, and B scales. Uh, which would literally intensify or take the intensity out of uh, certain areas of light points, right? So everything that's in uh, clip masked in in between these two, uh, the channel mixer and the hue and saturation, become you know brighter or less intense, right? Uh, also, directionally, if you're using the hue and saturation, if you double click it, the property should pop up, and you can change the hue, which will literally change the direction. Uh, of highlights. So if I wanted a cast light that goes from one end actually flipped over to the other I would then adjust the channel mixer uh, maybe take out some of the red a little bit more uh, maybe if you wanted to up the green um, and you could just pick and balance it out so this way the lights now more to the side of the figure uh, you get a few more highlights along the arm and you can just flip it up right Maybe that's way too intense. And maybe somewhere along there, right? Uh, so there is that. And then I made an extra pass with a different material. So uh, I made an actual specular pass, which I wanted to use. So this makes it look a little bit more like metal and maybe the cloth on the cape a little bit more liquid, like a, like a high specular, like patent leather or like sort of a rubbery composite material. Um, so you can get some effects like that. So choose your material as well. Uh, so like if you have more of a diffuse material, um, instead of having to, you know, paint in a material, you can literally just, you know, drop in a new material inside of Keyshot. Uh, I think in this way, probably I'll use like a, let's see if what happens if we have a specular or maybe a chrome. So chrome polished might work. So you could do something like this. Uh, I think there's also, there should be a dark black. I think maybe somewhere in here, maybe Blackberry or something that, that I used. I can't remember which material I used actually. For that, I'm sorry. But uh, you can get the same effect, which is awesome. So you just drop uh, and copy over the material. So I'm gonna copy the material and paste it in and other other places or uh, you can take the whole scene select the whole model which should select it and drag and drop say yes no oh, no for some reason it didn't select everything oh well that's fine I can just copy the material uh, here we go I'll get this one copy material and just go clicking about and pasting the material. Uh, paste material? No. There we go. Paste it. Paste link to material. And so once I have all of the coverage, it'll look something like this, right? So the whole thing has more, more specularity. And then I'll do one render pass using, of course, the render same setup same camera because of course this camera here I want to save it first before I do a render so if I put this over to the side make sure that you save uh, at least the file uh, and then your camera that way or you could package it so if you're gonna move to a different computer you can save it as a package and it should open up exactly like you have it from uh, one computer over to the other so I have a camera saved and I'll just lock it Oops, you can just click here, lock that, and that's good to go, right? Uh, and then do a render. And when you come back to Photoshop, 
you should have two different materials, right? So this black spec is that. Uh, and then some out, out of this basic setup that I, I just showed you for Keyshot, I added Diffuse, Shadow, and AO. And pretty much from, from the top, the AO and Shadow are set up as multiply letter, layers. And basically what that'll do is give me some shadows, you know, or ambient occlusion shadows in a lot of the cavities, uh, recesses, uh, you know, where there's uh, a little bit of depth. Uh, and just make it all the more richer for an object uh, lighting wise and then I think diffuse is one that uh, the diffuse and the uh, black spec pass I think both of those are going to be linear dodge uh, layers in additive and I just change the opacity as I need it uh, and then I think I did a copy of the specular pass and added on to that because I have it painted only into specific areas so for this, you can notice that it has a layer mask, uh, which I will fill with black once I have the layer mask in, and then just brush in and paint in a specific area in, in white, and it'll clear the mask and show the material that I want to use in one little focused area, right? Uh, and then I added some cut lines, and this is very easy to do, uh, and it's really cool because uh, I like to do you know a lot of mecha, uh, or mech designs or cyborg designs and I need sometimes little extra lines that I or details added in that I, I didn't necessarily sculpt and so what I did was use an effects layer and if I double click this effects layer for those that are kind of new to Photoshop uh, I just used like a bevel and emboss uh, but the interesting thing about this um, is that you can use the shading uh, angle to basically sort of change your direction uh, of the highlight. So if I zoom in here really close, you notice there's like a nice little embossed uh, highlighted uh, edge that'll give you some specularity after, uh, off of the cut. And what I'll do is I'll just, you know, increase the width. This is also the distance that it takes from the center point and the angle is what it uses to make some of these highlights along the edge. So I'll just add in details that way. Uh, and then I can sort of think of my design in a, in a modular sense and then you know add material and then a cut line to surround it and it starts to solidify a little bit more right then I think uh, I added some red stripes to his helmet and let's see red stripes paint over specularity a little bit uh, paint over bits is just smaller little details on the model uh, scratches and whatnot that I painted in and then I added a blue LED uh, for the, just to make an eye. And so there's really literally no detail in his eye space. I just had to create it on the fly in, in, in Photoshop. Yeah. Uh, and with this effect uh, for doing, you know, little hot glow, uh, LED glows, uh, basically what I did was a stroke um, with inner shadow and outer glow. And for stroke, I believe I use only like two pixels of a sort of like a, an aqua color, which kind of hides out the simple uh, stroke that I had originally put down for it in color, uh, but it just kind of overlaps it a bit, right? Uh, inner shadow is a, a shadow on the inside of the by the same color, um, and then usually outer glow, right? So you can usually set something like inner glow and outer glow. Uh, or inner shadow, those might uh, that might also work. I think I used inner shadow in this instance, but usually it would be stroke, inner shadow, or excuse me, not inner shadow, uh, uh, inner glow. Pardon, uh, inner glow. So I used like a little bit of a more of a bluish hue than green, uh, and then on the outside used a little bit of a lighter color. And I do this in two passes: one that has an effects layer, uh, so I'll hit OK on that, and then a blue bloom on the outside uh, just to give it a little bit more uh, of an ambient look I suppose there we go and it starts to to uh, shape up I think in this instance I, I might have changed some things with my um, layering or the the lighting in the geometric normal it wasn't exactly like it was before but uh, let's see if I can square it kind of back do this way some 
details be, are kind of gum, gumming up and being a little bit uh, maybe overlit because I changed some things and some settings, but you can kind of get it back. There we go. You can adjust your light right there. So that's kind of cool. And there's just a small uh, amount of gray here in the background uh, below the actual render layer. So uh, this RGBA is the actual beauty pass render. Uh, under that I added a gradation and just a flat background, right? So probably uh, as far as like um, some of the materials, uh, details that I, you know, because I, beyond these details of uh, material that I put in, I actually wanted to have like a, a, a good breakup of materials so that you could sort of define the character a little bit more. Uh, so I added a few other things like shadows, uh, smaller painted details. I think uh, that's a white strip of fabric there. Uh, and then added in uh, just a few clippings um, layer masked in of like carbon fiber and also nylon material. Uh, and so that gives it a little bit more of a uh, the look of a uh, cloth and actual carbon fiber and I just let the lighting take care of the rest maybe ever so slightly a little bit more uh, paint over um, here and there for highlights and whatnot uh, I think this is also for the tubes and things like this you can kind of um, be a little bit uh, resourceful and just go on Google image or Pinterest and find uh, like a texture image um, and then I just, you know, c copy and paste and then set it inside of the layer mask and it works out pretty good. Uh, maybe just a minor bit of adjustment, right? And so stacked on one on the other, that would be probably the base of the thing. Uh, and then probably after that, I set up another group uh, where I start doing uh, a continuous amount of detail, right? So if I turn this on uh, and uncheck these, can kind of see how this is built up on top of each other. So I think I added a, a multiply for uh, just a, a little bit of shadow at the bottom and at the top as well. Not sure what that one was, but somewhere in there there's got to be another. Uh, and then some of the HUD elements like my own logo, uh, I have set up in Illustrator and there's a couple of different things that you can use from Illustrator. Like if you had HUD elements, you can add them in uh, from Illustrator uh, and then just copy and paste them into Photoshop. Uh, I have had a lot of success copying things in as smart layers and then converting that into a rasterized pixel. Uh, so I just took uh, my own logo and outlined it in Illustrator and then copied and pasted it in as a smart layer. That way when I uh, use the transform tools inside of Photoshop and I scale it down, uh, it doesn't really lose or, or degrade the image quality of the logo or, or of the graphic, right? And therefore you can kind of mess with it a little bit more before you change it to an actual raster pixel image. So I added a, a color dodge that has been blurred of that to give it sort of that nice, almost Mamoru Oshi sort of orange haze. <laughs> like uh, if you guys have ever seen Ghost in the Shell or Innocence or something like that, he, he always likes to do like computer graphics and like this bright orange, I, I love it. And so I wanted to use something kind of familiar like that. Um, and then I used HUD elements. There's a gentleman or a couple of people actually uh, in and around uh, uh, DeviantArt that have some great HUD packs that you know are kind of copy, copyright free. So I just use, use those brushed on a, on a layer uh, and start setting some stuff up, uh, changing the opacity uh, building up the graphic and so at its base it kind of looks like this right uh, and then some of these I changed to color dodge uh, or I would make an extra copy and blur it and then change it to color dodge uh, just to get it ready so it looks sort of like a floating holographic and then put in a nice cast of orange over that and then that's how you get your end result right uh, 
Lastly, once I got to about here, I think in the top amount of details, you know, you can always do a couple of extra things. Um, here's a trick that it, I, di I didn't know until uh, maybe a few years ago, but um, in Photoshop, generally, if you wanted to create like a quick comp layer uh, to mess with, if you just hit like new layer, uh, I'll place this one absolutely on top uh, because some of these are hidden. Uh, what you can do is you can actually hold Alt on the keyboard. Uh, that makes works for Mac and PC. And then if you mouse left click uh, and go merge visible, it will actually comprise uh, a sort of a composite of all of the visible layers. And so a lot of times I'll do this in steps and then flat. It, it's better than flattening it because then at least it's non-destructive so I can go back and, and work it a little bit more. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, James. Appreciate it. If you guys have any questions, please do ask um, and let me know. And I'll I'll try to. Uh, I, I like I'm, I have two screens here, so I'm, I'm keeping one eyeball peeled on the, the chat a little bit. But every once in a while, I do miss think things. So uh, you'll have to give me a, a sec, and I'll and I'll try to come back and answer your questions as I as I can. Um, so anyway, once you have a composite layer, you can kind of mess with that without really um, you know really working in a non-destructive way so you don't have to mess up any of your layers or layer order. Um, and so I'll do something like this. Uh, and then I think I used a quick little action that uh, I grabbed uh, from one of the tutorials by Anthony Jones. Uh, he had a really great uh, uh, action set. Uh, and in that, it had like a, a nice chromatic aberration, which in and of itself, when you run this, when you choose it and you hit play, it will actually make another composite layer on top of that generally. Uh, a lot of these actions will. So uh, chromatic aberration and then he has one that's called final touches which uh, will add a certain amount of noise. Uh, so if I use this and hit play, you'll see that it will create another layer. And if it's too strong, what I can just do is just go ahead and bump down the opacity and get sort of like a nice mix in between what was that chromatic aberration which is kind of almost hard to tell uh, depending on the object, but you can really see it kind of in the details where the RGB values kind of shift in the graphic. And it sort of adds like a nice sort of rich, uh, almost kind of like a retro uh, look to it. Like there's sort of like a purple haze in and around the, the selection edge around here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Control Alt Shift E for merge. Yeah, you can do something like that. Uh, but it's also it's probably the same thing like you can also set up an action for yourself and, and do s similar steps but uh, the same thing goes for a chromatic aberration I think there's a few cool YouTube videos on on being able to do it but it has to do a lot with the lens correction filter inside of Photoshop right so once I get to a point like this you know maybe there might be a little a few extra overpaint details that I'll do uh, and then you know you can move forward and or finish it off so that's pretty much how I created something quick and short. You know, just as a proof of concept, uh, a lot of times when I'm sculpting something, I'll, I'll stop and actually do a project like this to just sort of do some look development. Uh, and then I'll, I'll go back uh, and use this as reference to my own sculpt, <laughs> really. So, you know, as a, as a concept designer, um, you have to really sort of be on, on yourself about time. Uh, and sometimes you have to stop and give a, a director or a producer or art director uh, sort of, you know, uh, at least some type of iteration, right, uh, of a design. Because with design, you're never working for, you, you're, not, you're not designing for yourself, you're designing for other people. And in a lot of ways, this is, this is pure uh, uh, self-gratification where I'm, I'm actually developing uh, my own look. So... I want to create uh, the model and sculpt it and, and technically build it out, but I also want to test it and see what it looks like if I added, you know, nylon, if I added carbon fiber, if I added more material breakups from one, like uh, I could go back and probably render cloth on most of these sections and only have like, say, a few areas that have, you know, glossy specularity, right? Or I can change the lighting and see uh, which forms stand out and be a little bit uh, better for me. Uh, or have like a little bit more of a, a dramatic flair to them. Um, just in short, so you saw uh, some of the stuff that I 
did for the uh, effects layers for the eye. I also carried that over to the elbow and using the same sort of uh, um, effect for a shadow from this blue that's being cast off of the elbow servo. Uh, I think I just used like a color dodge with an airbrush set really low. Uh, in and around 18 to 20 percent should be fine for something and just paint it in a nice little highlight that's uh, dimmed down uh, to carry over right uh, there's some there's actually some imperfect areas in this render uh, that I had missed initially uh, it had a small glitch because I think I did it at like two minutes and so there's actually some weird pixelation stuff but something like this again you know because you're using Photoshop which is a uh, an uh, you know, a photographic, you know, pixel editor, you can do a little bit of pixel pushing and, you know, probably paint it out, yeah? So, all in all, nice quick job, maybe only took like an hour or two of flanagling to, to work out, but, you know, in the end, you know, it pays off and it has a, a really nice image to it. So I'm going to close this just because I don't want to save it, but I have an extra copy of it, so don't worry. Uh, I'm going to actually try to make some of those available for you. Uh, for you guys to, to see. There's a Photoshop uh, document that I think I, I gave out to some of my Patreon guys of that one, uh, but I'll try to make it accessible for everybody on ZBC to kind of look at the breakdown, or maybe I'll take a, a layer screenshot and you guys can toy around with it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, the end result is it, it comes out pretty good. So there's a couple of things that I'm actually trying to experiment with uh, ZBrush and, and create like new 2D looks. Uh, and usually they kind of come from doing line art, right? So uh, several other people have probably created a, a shader uh, where you can use the 3D posterization. So back in, in ZBrush, you know, a lot of times, uh, I think under your render uh, and probably under the render properties, uh, the 3D posterization scale usually tends to flatten things out a little bit. Um, and you can experiment with this and or take a look at some of the other uh, uh, materials that people have done to sort of create like a comic book look. Um, one of the cleanest that I, I like to do is, you know, through Keyshot, uh, but it, it looks very technical. It's, it's not as organic. So I, I like to use them in different places. So like if I want something that has more of an organic feel, I might actually do a BPR, like an internal you know, in-house render in, in the BPR system inside of ZBrush, uh, and then move the model or diff other models that are, you know, adjoined and do uh, something a little bit more technical in Keyshot. Um, just to show, I believe, let me see if I can find it. Uh, one of these guys I opened up earlier, and I want to show you guys again. just need to find it. I am actually in the midst of creating uh, another character model that I was hoping to show you guys. Give me just a second here. I gotta move a few things around. Andre, let me answer your question. I have a question. Uh, have you ever tried to use the Toon Shader material in Keyshot to create uh, some render for simulate the drawing? Uh, to create uh, a Toon Shader inside of Keyshot. Um, to simulate a drawing, yes. In fact, um, I was gonna open something else up and show you guys. I just need to find it. Oop. There we go. Let's open up this guy and have a look. I have so much st stuff saved around. I need to organize better. <laughs> so bear with me. But uh, I'm gonna give you an example of this. Um, there we are. Um, this, also this here, uh, and I had another one of recent. I'm gonna open up this just in case as well. Uh, and I'll open up this. And it seems like there was one more that I'm missing. But for them now, I'm just gonna go ahead and open with Photoshop for these. Here we go. And one more. I'll go over to my renderings. Uh, here it is. Okay, so I'll grab these three guys and open them. So this is the stuff that I've been toying with uh, over the last two weeks uh, in my spare time. 
trying to uh, come up with some stuff to show you guys. This is a character of mine from a comic that I'm drawing. And I'm planning on showing you guys a couple of really cool ways of doing uh, very technical drawings from, you know, in, in a scenario like using comics. Uh, but they're sourced for absolutely from ZBrush, right? Like all of this was, this is basically a concept mesh uh, that I'm still trying to break up and then detail. But this is my main character from my comic, The War Taurus, and his, the character's name is Goro. And Goro has these, uh, he has, he, he pulls influence from a, a, a lot of uh, uh, various like anime and manga that I, that I love. But he's basically a, a cybernetic karate master, sort of a head nod to uh, Kishido's uh, battle angel Alita. And although I won't talk about the story, the character himself, he's, he's a really big guy, probably almost close to two meters. And I, I want to draw him, but his head is very complex. He, like he takes some influence from uh, the Terminator and Mazinger Z and a couple of other things, right? But you know, all of his cybernetic uh, uh, body parts are very complicated to draw. And and I always felt when I drew the comic that he was ever changing, ever so slightly, panel to panel. And so to keep some consistency, I've decided that I'm going to probably draw some pages over uh, using a ZBrush model to communicate some of that. And I'm not going to probably, I'll make one model and pose him up, but I still want to use hand-drawn, uh, a hand-drawn flavor, right? Because if you look at this, there's not very much in the way of line variation. In some places there are, but a lot of the lines are going to be static and they're not going to be go from thick to thin too much. Some of them are going to be probably one weight, uh, which is not super organic, but I could change this. I could literally if I wanted to, I uh, use the line art as a sketch uh, coming from ZBrush ren and, and render it, or ZBrush to Keyshot and render it, uh, and then dim that line art and turn it into non-photo blue and actually ink over it by hand, which is something that uh, is a process I've been working out to see if it would be feasible to do. And it would, it would be a lot of fun. Uh, so maybe one of these days coming soon here, I, I actually wrecked my, my webcam, so I'm not able to uh, literally show you an example of this uh, just yet but it's something that I'm working on but yes you could do a simple animation character turn uh, just by using a key shot and or BPR with a tune shader and then you could turn the object uh, in this case I think I did three small renders just to place it um, which are on a transparent layer like so uh, so you know with these you can always dim them down uh, and re-ink the, the line art or uh, pretty much do anything that you wanted to with it. Um, you can almost probably do like an animation if you had uh, renders of each step of the, the character and its movement this way and then, you know, draw around it <laughs> for animation purposes. If you were doing literally a very complex object with 2D animation, you could probably use something like this and render frame for frame uh, to do, you know, just like key animation. Um, which I, I, I won't speak uh, from the experience of an animator. I, I mostly just do static illustration, but uh, in the realm of doing things, something that can move or, or be you know tune shaded and then move, yeah, I wouldn't say that it's impossible to do. So this guy is something that I'm working on. Actually, you know what? Let's open this guy up in ZBrush and I'll, I'll show you guys a go of how it looks. Over here. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to open this up. Don't save that. And here we go. And just kind of sh to show you the amount of detail that goes into something like this, um, it's actually not too bad. But I'll show you how I've broken down the model. And we'll, we'll save this one, say, for uh, next month because I'll probably do some work and then show some breakdowns. And do stay tuned to the ZBrush Central page because if I can, uh, I'd like to work it where I can take some overtime clips to ZBrush Live. Uh, because a lot of times when I'm working, sometimes I'll record myself just to see the, the choices and steps that I make. Uh, and I'll try to share those with you guys. Uh, Take sometimes to, if it's any longer than 15 minutes, I'll have to probably uh, do a time lapse and speed it up so that you guys are not sitting around waiting for each step. But 
just to give you guys a l short little bit of a character breakdown for this guy, uh, because he has more of a humanoid form, I decided to break up the model uh, and do head first. Uh, so it was head and then using uh, just you know regular Dynamesh or uh, Z spheres uh, that I'll build out to build the silhouette and then I use a, a density of one and then you know do some subdivisional modeling to kind of uh, get some of the, the silhouettes and forms built up. So most of these are just like raw, you know, Damien Standard, uh, hard, uh, hard polish uh, to polish out, move tool, uh, sometimes orbs crack, uh, and a few other, uh, you know, just simple alphas to give just a tiny bit of detail, and I'll work up forms, right? Uh, so I've broken up all of these sections from uh, different parts, different body parts. So he has a few other details in his face, uh, little uh, kitbashed pieces, uh, or smaller bits like these little rivets along or brackets along his head. Uh, the original comic book version of this, in fact, might be interesting to show you this. Uh, we'll open up Acrobat. And. Do -do -do -do. This is a, a comic that I illustrated previously. Uh, from which this character comes from and in the intro uh, you know he, he has like this weird sort of um, Munchausen look uh, he has no nose but uh, later on in the pages he, he got a little bit more of an interesting look but I wanted to really redo it and redo it in a 3D way and so I drew this as sort of like a traditional manga with ink and paper and half tones but uh, let's see here. Probably one of the best frames of him. This was his sort of more original design, and I wanted to give him a, a look in ZBrush. Uh, so he just has like a sort of like a small mouth, no nose, and eye sockets kind of very reminiscent of, uh, you know, uh, the old Terminator, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger Terminator, you know, once uh, his face was exposed. But he has these long tri horns, which I won't give away. Uh, the reason why he has the tri-star horns, but we'll get to that later. But that was his original look, so I wanted to carry that over. And so smaller area um, pieces, you know, I would use kit bash sets uh, or kit bashes that I, I built myself. Um, sometimes some of the stock uh, pieces, like you know, the rings of his eyes here, uh, and then other pieces I would make and manipulate just using like the uh, Z modeler. So this is just like a small block that has been, you know, shaped into a sort of like a bracket. Uh, I have a hose that I've made quite complex from somewhere else that I use as a kit bash, and this, so this was curved in for a sternomastoid. And basically, they're just proxy pieces, right? Um, and along with you know carving in, uh, doing a little bit of alpha stamping, uh, that's how I got the arms and the chest. A little bit more detail at the back. I'll just, you know, mask off certain areas and put in, like, uh, I believe that's one of the alien skin hexes just for his, uh, the mesh. So just something to indicate that there are flexible areas and hard areas, uh, creating a nice mix. And then we can, you know, perhaps later when we texturize this, uh, because if I, I, I'm planning later to probably do, like, a full-on build and a render that you can probably look at inside of Marmoset, I, I, I do want to at least sculpt some areas that will be uh, very uh, understandable uh, differences in material breakup, right? So soft areas, hard areas, uh, and sort of like a, a mechanical organic mix, yeah? So there's back, arms, uh, the buttocks, the thighs, uh, knee assembly and calf, and then I believe I used one of the insert body parts uh, that is an IMM already defaulted with ZBrush uh, to create the feet. Uh, these toes being proxy and actually I still need to work on the feet a little bit. Uh, and interestingly enough, I think I left some of the intact uh, subtools in here, but his fingers are basically duplicates of one finger, uh, I guess from the index to the, the small finger. And then the thumb was actually uh, 
sort of a, a an appended Z sphere, and then once I did an adaptive skin of it, I started uh, sculpting and carving it out. So, you know, pretty easy to manipulate these and pose them up. But I, what I really want to do is before I join this entire mesh, I, I want to make sure that all of the proportions are, are right. So, like, say these hands look a little bit big, and maybe the forearm is just a tad too short. Um, I will probably go in and make some adjustments and uh, use the world space uh, widget or gizmo to probably shape some things up doing a little bit of masking but they'll be really easy to manipulate later uh, and then you know if I'm not married to the design I can you know change it up and re-sculpt it and so that's where sort of like uh, Dynamesh comes into play and then I can retopologize it uh, in some instances using the Z-remesher uh, and polygrouping uh, by way of framing the mesh, uh, I can keep some of the hard edges um, and be able to, you know, uh, take a, a cut out of something uh, and then break it down further by doing group loops uh, and cleaning up the, the, the part once I have a, a back piece to it. So it kind of looks like, uh, if I was to show you the polygroups, this, is, this mesh is quite dense for the arms but I'll show you something like this. Uh, just as a concept mesh, what I've gone through and just masked all of the different sections that I intend to cut up. Uh, and so later, I'll probably show and hide different pieces, split them, uh, and then close holes to give them some backing. Uh, you know, and then once I push in some, some depth from a, a, like sort of a, a back piece, I'll go and sculpt up that piece uh, so that it's super sharp and clear, right? Because everything is still pretty loose Right about now. There we go. In fact, I, I think probably between the forearm, I have to retopologize here and kill everything on the inside uh, because if it's not cloth or like a like a mesh material, I'll probably have to put some type of mechanics and tubing inside of the the arm, but something flexible enough just to show. All right. So keep in mind, I'll do use this, and of course. Uh, just to show really quickly, I'm going to go over and do a, a new file over here in Keyshot. Uh, I'll discard this. I'll do that, right? Let's try to do a BPR, which is set to go to Keyshot. And I'll kind of show you just some small settings that I usually do with tune shading to kind of get it what it was in the previous image that I showed you. So taking a second to send it over, it's going to set it up and put it in the scene. Okay, so the big guy is really big on the grid. He's super huge. So for this, probably the environment uh, needs to change the size. Make it much bigger. Much bigger. Let's just say uh, 76 for that. And we'll pull in a little closer. And one of the first things I like to do, uh, because sometimes I don't always want them, is I'm going to kill ground shadows. I don't need them at this point. Uh, and I'm going to set up a color, which will be just uh, like a light gray, for example. And here in the material, I'm just going to click on Tune, or type in Tune. Oops. Tube. <laughs> nope. Tune. All right. There we go. So tune outline uh, black, and I'm just going to drop it on to an object. So when I put it on here, uh, the contouring doesn't pick up a lot of detail, right? It probably keep, it keeps uh, the strongest details and shows those. Uh, but if I have a lot of smaller uh, tertiary um, details, I might want to adjust a few settings uh, so that they also get picked up. And in this case, I'm going to go ahead and right-click and edit material. Uh, and you can do this in a couple of different ways. You could use the material pane here, uh, but you could also show the material graph if you're going to really specifically get into a material and change it up. Uh, just because I'm doing one simple flat shade, I really don't need to add any nodes to this. So I'm going to close this. But know that you can uh, edit your materials by using an actual node graph. Uh, but for this, 
pretty much what I want to do is change the width, uh, which is the contouring width that goes around the line or the line size. So I can bump this up if I wanted to. So zero, like maybe say six, eight or something like that. Gets a little bit thicker. Uh, and more importantly, the angle. So uh, its default is usually somewhere in around 30 degrees, but uh, I like to take and drop it all the way down to say 12. And so that way it's super heavy and it picks up all of the details that I sculpted in. You know, probably fine, uh, maybe a little bit this this mesh pattern is probably too dense for to make a, a really good pattern uh, for this in line but that's okay uh, because I, I can keep adjusting it so maybe I'll jump and go 14 see still see how it looks uh, maybe 16 and that way I can sort of gauge if I need a, a number in between those two numbers and um, maybe I can add a decimal and change the degree just to, to less severity right uh, shadow strength. Uh, if you have, uh, if you wanted to use shadows, you can actually use them. I don't use them too much. Uh, and then, if you, depending on the objects that you have placed on top of each other, you can also use transparency. So, like if I copied uh, this material, and pasted it here on the arms, it'll be shared, uh, and I can just go around and do the same for all of the other ones. Paste length material. Paste length material. Do the fingers. Uh, turn it around. You guys will have to excuse me if there's a little bit of back background noise. My boys are running around the peanut gallery. Is running around being crazy. Every once in a while, the dynamic range of a mic will actually pick up stuff like that, so I apologize if I'm slightly interrupted. Paste material. Okay, and so just about here, small bits that are divided. Uh, there we go. Paste material. Okay. So if I wanted to break these up, if I wanted to say change the color, uh, have like a, a tune outline, um, I can change the color of different elements if I wanted to. Uh, just unlink them, like say if you want a different color for the arms, you can unlink the material. It'll un it'll keep it unchanged, but then you can just edit the material again, and you could say do something like you know add a different color, um, maybe a cool gray. Something like that, uh, and this can also help you. Um, in the instance where I want to do things in, in Photoshop, once I render the line, uh, generally I'll just do black and white. And then previous streams I've shown, uh, I showed you guys some of my action set. <laughs> you know what's funny, James is uh, my better half is actually a Disney employee, and so <laughs> I don't know. It's like being a Disneyland with Disneyland. I don't know, maybe, but uh, it's it's certainly it, it's it's fun. I'm sure for them. If I was a kid, I would want to be them. It would be awesome. They they have a few a few things that in my day we we didn't have. You know, less on the video games and less on the touch technology. Yeah, so cool for them. But uh, usually in a render in black and white, what I can do is in Photoshop, I can separate the line art. So uh, just to show really quick, uh, in fact, let me go back to Keyshot and I'll do this in white and say okay. And say, pose it, get the camera right about where I want it. Like what if you wanted a shot that was right about, right about here, right? So you could save this out, render it, and if it was entirely in white, especially the background as well, uh, environment, this color here, click absolute white, say OK. So if I rendered this and I had a line, a bit of a, a, a line sample, uh, what I could do is skip over to Photoshop. Derp, derp, derp. There we go. 
Uh, and I've separate I've separated this out before, but let's say from here, if I made a duplicate of this, and that duplicate is flat, and I'll go ahead and flatten the image. There's a couple of different things that I could do from here, and I've created a an action set which I, I still need to share with you guys. Um, but I, I use this a lot for my own comic book work, uh, and there's two things I go, I, two ways I go about this. One is uh, sort of a post scanning tool, uh, which does levels, curves, and threshold. Uh, for this, I think some of the details might get wiped out if I was to kind of clean it up and run threshold, but it would strengthen some of the strongest lines. So I'm actually going to uncheck threshold. And I'll just show you what the post scanning does. It'll kind of clean up some of the gray pixels or anti aliased gray pixels on the screen uh, and make the line art sample all the more cleaner, right? So, like, for example, if I, if I drew something on paper uh, and I, I say drew every line, line for line, and I took and scanned it on a, on a scanner bed, uh, some, air, some lines, you know, uh, or like the pencil lines would be gray. Uh, some of the stronger ones would be closer to the scale of absolute black. And so, you know, what if I wanted to clean it up for clarity's sake? Well, I could run this post scanning script here or action set. And what it would do is kind of clean up and get rid of all of the gray pixels um, in this case and make the image a little bit more sharper. Uh, the adverse effect here is this mesh still under the arm is a little bit more dense and probably it's gonna blotch a little bit and turn to black. So I'd have to probably work that out a little bit better. But I can then go on to the second part of this uh, action set, which is a line works masking separation. And what this uses is uh, basically some of the selection tools in Photoshop, along with uh, quick mask mode, to separate out and place and fill a transparent uh, layer with all of the line art on it. And I'll just uh, show you how that works. One of the first steps that I want to do before I do that, however, is click here and just default my palette, my foreground color to black, my background color to white, right? Uh, and the image needs to be in a mode that is grayscale instead of RGB color. Uh, it's just because of the way that the selection and the, the actual channels work, because if it's grayscale, uh, the only channel that should exist would be one that is gray or the black and white, uh, black and white line art. Uh, and then I can run this, um, this uh, action here. So from line, art, line works masking separation, I'm going to go ahead and run it. And it's been run. And what you'll see here is I have all of the line art on a transparent layer, right? with a background that is just purely white, right? And this line art, you could do whatever you wanted to it. If you wanted to change it to like say a multiply uh, and have that there, or just a, a simply just a black and white line art channel, it'll actually split it and separate it apart, right? And it only takes a few seconds. I've been using the same action since probably Photoshop 7 at least, <laughs> before CS came out. But it's, it's this, the same steps haven't really changed from version to version. And it's just a simple, really quick way that I use in comics to like say take inked line art uh, that is black and white and knock out the background, the white background so that I can colorize it and I can start painting. Which isn't to say that you could not scan it, clean it up, do the same thing except for the separation and then use multiply color layers over it. You could do something like that. But I like to have solid you know, unadjusted color underneath something. So if I wanted to, uh, or sometimes I use halftone screens like the manga screen tones for which I've, I've made my own. Um, I like to use those in illustrations. Um, you can use those. But <clears throat> just very quickly, I'll come in and I can, you know, do whatever I wanted to. I can paint under here, uh, take the smoothing off of that, change the shape. There we go like a 88 or something like that change the mode over to RGB and don't flatten it right so now in this layer one I can come and select a new color and start painting underneath 
right? Right, and so you can do just like you do when you if you if you're normally used to, to painting or coloring your images almost like in a, a comic book fashion, you can do all of that, uh, but you have to separate the line art so you can do it. I could also uh, should have probably built a mask so that I can I can paint inside of the object, but yeah, you can do something like that, or you know uh, I can place uh, halftone screens. Uh, I think this because of the pixel ratio is a little bit different so if I paste any screens I don't have any prepared for this line screen value so that might be a little bit hard but uh, just for example shake I'll give you guys a, a peep at how this works uh, let me it should be in my recent list but it's not that's okay I'll just go ahead and open up open it up from where it is uh, my own collection of tone. And any questions you guys have so far? Believe me, if you wanted to ask, do not fear. Ask me a question. I will try to answer it as, as well as I can. But anyway, uh, so I have <clears throat> a collection of uh, screen tones that I use for comics. Uh, they're all 300 DPI use, uh, but they come in different uh, line screens. So like say for example, 300 DPI, 50 lines per inch. If I use this, the actual dot mesh is gonna be a lot more dense uh, and I can open it up. And let's say if I wanted to start using a 10% pattern, if you look closely, these are actually camera ready uh, bitmapped dots on a transparent layer and I can select the whole layer copy it bring it over to my artwork paste it and then when I paste it uh, it's neatly on the art but I need to get it and it's only in certain you know so it needs to fall within the lines so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually take that and use again that great thing layer masking and in this layer mask I'm at, because I'm gonna actually uh, just fill it with the foreground black just like 100% black and it looks like it disappeared but it's not it's actually still on the layer it's only masked in to a certain area uh, that I will create the mask for so in that I'll take a brush uh, at 100% and I'll do something like uh, like a hard round, small, come over here, and no transfer, just a shape dynamic. That should be fine. And I can start painting on this mask. I'll hit X to flip the, the black to white, and make sure that you have this layer mask selected here, and then you can just start painting in dots, dot shapes. So if I want some extra kind of like uh, like uh, either if I'm doing comics for print or if I want to just show sort of like a, uh, a contrast value without actually having to paint everything I can use this as sort of a nice proxy and uh, give it some sort of uh, look like you would probably get from uh, you know like clip studio or clip paint studio uh, Mongo studio uh, but you can just paint on your dot shades right and everything falls within the, the masked area. And if I get any overage, of course, I can hit the E key on the keyboard and then just, you know, take it right out. But everything is non-destructive because I'm only working on the actual layer mask, right? So, other things that you can do. But most importantly to this stream, the cool thing is all of these details can be just sculpted up and, you know, you can come up with a pretty complex character inside of ZBrush and then worry about the rest uh, you know once you have it in Photoshop and then you quickly have yourself an image right or to completely take it out right and so that's basically sort of how I work with line art inside of Photoshop right uh, let's say for example let's go back I'm gonna actually close a few of these up 
No. I'll close this one up. And it's copy. Nope. I'll close up the tone. Um, those tone uh, sheets, I actually have not uh, made those public. They, I mean, they are public, uh, but I they actually are available inside of a kit that I made on, on Gumroad. Um, so I don't want to shamelessly self-promote too much, but uh, you can actually get your hands on them. Uh, they are in my manga pack, I believe. Uh, the second one. Uh, the first one actually has some some tones in it. Um, but I think they have them in slightly a different variety. But same thing, similar to that, was the first run of this. Uh, and in this case, I actually did use uh, the threshold part of that st action step, where I ran levels, curves, and threshold. And as you can see, what it did was it just kicked out all of the gray pixels and left like heavy ink, right? So for this, something like this might look a little bit more organic. <laughs> yeah, uh, the pitch is all it's all relevant. So thank you. So yeah, i just uh, I just thickened it up uh, and then ran that same action set. So if you actually do pick up uh, the tones, that action set is actually included with the kit. So you can actually get your hands on both in one one shot. I think it's my. Uh, uh, manga pack one and two, I believe, and soon I'll try to come out with a third. But um, yeah, everything starts from ZBrush, and then turns to two D, and then turns uh, into a Photoshop file from the render. Uh, and actually, line renders like this, where you're using a tune shade, and if you're just using it with black and white line art, it's actually really, really fast to render. So that you can get a lot of detail out of a very like fast two or three minute render, uh, but the staging that you get uh, from working in 3D, the perspective uh, and the, the proportions are going to be uh, probably a lot more spot on than if you hand drew it yourself. Not to say that you can't mix this with hand elements. So like if you have one mechanical object, like say this character, he's a hard surface character, he's in the scene, uh, but I want some more fluid looks in the background. You can, you know, of course use, you know, any type of uh, hand drawn or analog uh, ability and mix the two uh, until they they start to blend. Okay. Um, let's see. Also, some of the images that I, I saved out and posted uh, for you guys is just the sort of a breakdown, a visual breakdown. Uh, I'll try to make this available again uh, because I think when I posted it, I'm not sure if it the image might have messed up, but uh, just to show you kind of uh, an example of how far this came along. Uh, in a process, these were the, the basis of from which I, I worked from, right? And on this guy, I'm still, again, I'm still previewing, but uh, I'm starting to do a little bit of overpainted details, and of course, things like this can always be referenced uh, for future sculpting, you know, when you come back to your character and have some details thought out. Technique streams for 100% ZBrush is fine. Sweet, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm planning on on doing both in the future for you guys. Uh, there's a couple of things that I, I would love to experiment and see if we can come up with workflows for. Um, and there's a couple of old workflows that also still still work. You know, like when you come back to ZBrush, uh, a lot of these things are kind of um, more probably rudimentary or basic. Uh, uh, I guess novice type of uh, of ways to work. But there's some very interesting things that you can do, like um, uh, in the areas of retopology, especially now that uh, you know where Re ZBrush has gone uh, and and sort of coming along, uh, where you can you know pluck out bits of, of hard surface geometry, uh, give it some backing, and then manipulate that. Um, you can also use uh, the Z modeler. Like a lot of times, what I like to do is take pieces that I uh, concept mesh out. Like this looks probably very loose and kind of sloppy, but a lot of the contouring and the forms are there. Uh, and so, <laughs> treasure planets, I guess. Yeah, or I think it, what is it? Uh, there's probably a few different animations that have some nice, like almost two, 2D cell shading sort of, uh, I, I think they were probably 3D initially, but they, they also became like sort of more of a, a, a 2D animation. 
uh, one of which Gundam kind of, there's a few different series of Gundam that come to mind where they, they started using 3D more uh, kind of like Thund Thunderbolt is one of my favorites uh, of, of late um, I where you know they used 3D elements but only in, in the, the matter of staging I think they, they actually had to hand draw a lot of those but you know to get sort of like a, a proper look you could always use a 3D model uh, do your key animation and then you know flip it to a something draw over it in, in sort of a hand done way and make it look more 2D than, than it does 3D yeah. so these are things that I, I'm messing around with so again uh, you know what actually we still have a little bit more time I'll take uh, probably the last 20 minutes um, in the way that I was going to do some of these arms and this is kind of interesting I'm going to hit dynamic solo and I'll again show you some of the, the under the hood sort of uh, poly grouping that's going on here so these were initially uh, if I can find it correctly oh maybe I got rid of the I probably got rid of the uh, the Z spirit for it, but here's a good here's a good piece. Actually, I have the leg piece, like the thigh or the calf piece, uh, and I only did one side of that for this this model uh, because I only wanted uh, the base shape. And so, when you have Z spheres, and, and I, you guys, I'm sure have probably used Z spheres for doing armatures and whatnot. But a lot of times I'll use it and pose, uh, size some of it and pose it uh, into sort of like a gesture, right? Uh, and if you're new to ZBrush, of course, you can hit A and sort of see the, the object uh, skinned uh, with an adaptive skin around it, uh, which is a little bit uh, much like a unified skin, but I think the, the two are very different. Uh, adaptive being uh, what I'm going to get and actually append back to the model uh, so I can open this adaptive skin here and a lot of times what I'll do is once I get it drawn out uh, I preview it with a density of one and so this is just like working in in low poly right yeah it's just a, a just as viable but um, and every you, you'll notice that from the the poly grouping that you get here I think that's one two three four five different poly groups that is because of the fact that if I go back to the spheres, uh, it creates a polygroup every time you create a segment uh, in the Z sphere chain, right? Uh, and you can position this, uh, like I say, if I needed to reposition it, I could hit W and click on the actual individual sphere. I can also rotate some of these. Uh, so, like, say, for example, if I clicked here in between this chain, uh, if I wanted to move it or rotate it, I could. I could click on the middle of it and actually move it one way or the other and will actually move on axis, right? Or like it'll move also those that are chained along with it. Uh, like say if I alt click here, hold here, it's gonna move the entire shin position, right? So I'm not in individually moving the lower half of these, but I'm moving it from the middle of the stem uh, in the chain, right? And then I can re-preview it and see how much it's twisting. Uh, I can then make an adaptive skin uh, and then append that back to my project as a sub-tool. And individually, if you use like a small brush, um, you can take uh, and hit B, M on the keyboard and hit the, the move, or get the move brush. Uh, and if you make this small enough, you can actually edit individual polys, so or you know the the actual vertex point of the poly, uh, and you can get some interesting things. You can also hit uh, D and show the subdivision. So that's actually the dynamic subdivision, uh, and you can see how you get what kind of shapes you get that are subdivided, right? So just as just as a few basics, um, that's kind of how I form up uh, small pieces inside of ZBrush. Uh, a lot, especially with something like this. Uh, and then I just, uh, once I've worked it out, I just go back uh, and hit append and append back the actual piece that I made. So 
after making an adaptive skin, I'll just pin that back and it comes in as a new subtool. All right. So that's kind of how the fingers and the arms uh, got formed out. Here, I'll go back up here. And with something like this, I've been trying this. Uh, I know some of the, the guys from Canada, from Montreal, uh, like Cedric Seo, I believe is the last name, way, the way that you spoke, uh, pronounce his last name. Uh, Frederick and all of, the, all of the gentlemen over at, at Chaos Masons, they do this. Uh, as well, I pulled probably the similar way from Paul Gabry and by way of, uh, um, uh, I believe, uh, oh, who is it? Gosh, uh, gosh, his name is at the tip of my tongue. Um, Mike Jensen, Mike Jensen, and uh, also Mike Pavlovich have, have probably taught this method. But uh, plucking out pieces and then sculpting them up. Now, I could probably pluck out some geometry and build it exactly, probably poly for poly, uh, like a, a true poly modeling way. But it's very mechanical. It's it's not very organic and well, sometimes you just really want to highly develop a, a, a piece of, of geo before, uh, you know, just going at it. I mean, the good way is that you have some, some good topology and you, you might properly build something, but the shaping and the details might be underdeveloped unless you model it in that way. Well, you can do both in sort of more of a, a loose organic fashion by doing things this way, where you create a concept mesh that's very loose, uh, and sometimes you can harden up and polish uh, individual elements by masking and or hide and showing. But you can also make that a separate piece of geometry to specifically work up. Uh, so like, say for example, you know, control shift and clicking on one element, uh, I could actually split hidden on this. So using the keys split hidden. Uh, in fact, uh, before I do something like that, I better actually duplicate this. So I'll duplicate it just so that I don't mess up my original. Uh, hide that. Do that. Split hidden. And so I have a, a, a clipped out piece. And because both of these are symmetrical and I'm working on a symmetrical object, I'm gonna hit X and come out of, uh, uh, come out of symmetry. And I'm going to actually shift, or uh, control shift and then let up and hold alt to make this box, the selection box red, which is actually gonna hide that piece. Uh, and then if you were to look at your geometry tab under modify geometry, you could delete hidden, right? So I'm only keeping one side along the X or positive X side. There is no backing, but if you wanted to see the whole shell, you could under, I believe, visibility uh, show the normal uh, or the back face of the normal uh, da -da 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 -da. display property sorry and then show double and it would show you the inside and out so this actually has no uh, back face to it but you know there's a few methods that I'm gonna actually show you guys a little bit later probably in overtime uh, because it's it's not super well to to show and then explain at the same time <laughs> Like it takes a few minutes and some of you guys might, uh, it might take a little bit more time than I actually have this evening. So, but this is basically, how I'm, gonna, I'm gonna start plucking out shapes. Um, you could do something like closing holes on it, uh, which will give it a little bit of backing. Uh, let's see, close holes. And that'll create an inside shell. And then I could take the transpose Oops. There we go. And use the transpose to control click it and actually mask it. You see, does that work or is it still the same? W. There we go. So uh, whether you're using the gizmo or you're using the, the actual transpose line, if you control and actually click on a, on a polygroup, it'll mask out everything else and give you only that selected polygroup. But then I could take this and, you know, resize it in like so, and then push this inward, make that shell, that inside of the shell a little bit 
less uh, severe, you know, and just sculpt uh, sculpt this out. Uh, and if I'm working in, in DynaMesh, of course, I can see remesh this and clean it up. Uh, but probably I'll retopologize a lot of these pieces, and then I would probably start using a Z uh, the Z modeler on a lot of different parts to get the surface details out of it. Right? Did anybody have any questions? Lastly, before I take off, I know it's a lot of information, but if you guys go back and look, you know, I, I encourage you to do so. And of course, again, uh, I'm going to try to paste this again, but if you guys have any f uh, questions uh, after the post, naturally, you, I invite you to ask me in ZBrush Central. So I'll just uh, paste this link again. Here we go. And I want to thank you guys for watching. Cheers. I think I'm going to I'm going to cut it just a tad early today. But that's pretty much everything that I wanted to talk about, but if I have any last questions, I'll I'll try to answer before I finish today. Bring the trouble. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, but basically what I do, uh, at what I have been doing in ZBrush Live, if you care to um, have a look at some of the previous streams, which I invite you to do, uh, you can see them on Pixelogic's, uh, uh, Pixelogic, their ZBrush Live channel on Twitch, as well as the ZBrush Live channel on YouTube. I believe uh, probably just shortly after um, the stream ends, it'll probably update over to YouTube, and you can uh, also look and, and ask me questions there. I'll try to go back in the streams and look at the comments and uh, answer some, some questions that you guys have. But I invite you to look through, because it, progressively I've been working probably within uh, similar perimeters where uh, I'll do like a, a quick sculpt over the week, and then I'll try to figure out how to use it as a static 2D image uh, for, you know, anything ranging from like line art for comics or uh, for concept art, which usually tends to be a lot of what I do. <laughs> so designing something iteratively in steps or um, creating a, a fresh new base and then, you know, maybe it's something that I have to reuse, but I, I need to use it as inked line or maybe I need to fully render it. So I'll use it in conjunction with Keyshot and Photoshop uh, to come up with a, a design that I can use. Uh, or save myself the trouble of having to illustrate the same thing over and over again. Yeah. All right. Thanks again, guys. Thanks for joining me. You guys have yourselves a wonderful weekend. And thanks again to the guys over at Pixelogic. And stay tuned. I'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.